Good morning, good morning, and did you know that today is the church's birthday? Today is Pentecost Sunday, which is traditionally the church's birthday, and we are so very excited um, to be able to lift that up today. It is also Memorial Day weekend, and we are so very thankful um, for those who have worked so hard to give us our freedom, and we are on a, we're taking a break this Sunday from our God-given series uh, where we're learning all about the um, gifts and the uh, passions and the abilities and our personalities that God has given us. So make sure you come back next week as we talk and dive into personalities. We want to connect with you because we're family. We are a New Life Church family. And we love our family. and We want to know what's going on with our family. So take 10 seconds, text the word connect to the number that's on the screen or the QR code that's in front of you. And let us know that you're here. Let us know if you have any prayer concerns concerns or any questions that you might have and um, we would will be able to connect with you and and be able to answer those right away please stand with us as we get ready for worship good morning church my name is Victor Neal. I'm the worship arts director, whether you're here online or whether you're here in person, excuse me, or worshiping online, I'm glad that we are together worshiping. We're going to sing a new song this morning. This song talks about the goodness of God, how if we lived a thousand years, we would never see the end of his goodness. Amen? There's so much more um, that God wants to show us, whether it's good times or in bad times, God wants to surprise us with his goodness. Um, so I want you to sing this song. It's really, really catchy. It's really easy to jump in and sing. Um, but if you know that this is true, if you know that God's goodness is never ending, I want you to sing it from your heart. Is that a deal? Let's sing together.
one more time as a church family. We will never see the end. We will never see the end of your goodness. Oh, we will never see the end. We will never see the end of your goodness. the kind of God we serve, church. God is good. I was buried in me my shame You could carry that kind of he was, he was my 
chains way back the way to your glory. I need a shelter. I was an orphan. So God, as we have celebrated that glorious day, not the day, a day that we know in our lifetimes, but a day in history. Not only when you rose from the grave, but you invited us into new creation. Because when you rose from the grave, just like your friend Lazarus, you also call us out of sin out of self-destruction, out of the habits of this world, out of the conditioning of this world. And you call us into new life, only available, only possible through your grace. We're only able to forgive because you forgave us first. We're only able to show mercy to others because you have shown us mercy. We're only able to experience grace and to share that grace with others through your word and through fellowship. Only available because you, through your Holy Spirit, has been pursuing us first through grace. So God, as we sing that song that celebrates your goodness, how there's always something new to you. No matter where our location is, God, you just sit in goodness and you invite us to sit with you. As we're a body of people who come of, from the tradition of your Holy Spirit falling on your followers and then declaring the gospel to other people in their own language. As we sit now in that reality, part of our tradition, part of our heritage, God, we just ask that today, this Sunday, be a Sunday where you do what you always do and just change us. We let go of our preconceived notions. We let go of our personal sacred cows. We let go of all those things where we think we're okay. And God, we just give you all the good and the bad today. Rearrange our hearts through the sermon, through the worship, through the encouragement of just being in the body of Christ today, whether we are physically here or online. We invite you into our hearts. Your Holy Spirit was here before we even got up this morning. And you just want to be with us, to move us to be more like your son, Jesus, to change us. And we invite that change this morning. And throughout this week, whatever space we occupy, we ask that that change would also be available to the people that we interact with, the people we talk with, the people that we love, our friends, our acquaintances, people that we might not even know. Move us in that direction. Give us eyes to see. And now, church, let's pray as Jesus taught those who follow him to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, that is a great way to rock into the church's birthday. Amen. 
The people up here, we've been talking about God-given talents. These people are definitely using their God-given talents for music to help us in our spiritual uh, worship this morning. And, and Victor, I got to take a minute and say that prayer is definitely one of your God-given gifts. I love to hear you pray. And I don't mean to embarrass you, but I love to hear you pray. So thank you for using your God-given gift with us here at New Life Church. We are excited. I have only one name on my little sheet for birthdays this week, but it's a big birthday. And it's one of the people that I really love the most. I love you all, but I do love this one a little bit most. <laughs> When you're stuck on a kayak trip for three hours and you have the possibility of dying because of a thunderstorm, you form a blonde. I, you know, and so Ben Maxwell is turning 21. So Ben, we wish you a happy early birthday, my friend. Um, so pray for Ben as he enters this 21st chapter of his life. And as you're praying, my friends, please pray uh, for the former pastor of this church, Jimmy Edwards. Uh, he passed away, and his um, celebration of life will be held on June the 6th at 3 p.m. at Mount Pisgah. And so we pray for him, his family, and all the people that he has touched while he was here on earth. Um, we do... Oh. I did the adult birthdays, but I did not do the children's birthdays. I got a little carried away this morning. Um, we do have two very special birthdays for children this week, and that would be Gavin and Miss Vivi, who are having birthdays this weekend, too. So we hope that those little ones enjoy their birthday as well. New Life Church has a lot of generosity to be thankful for. God has really blessed upon us um, folks who are generous, who allow us to send mission teams um, around the U.S. and around the world. And this year, our mission team is going to Costa Rica. And because of your generous gifts, we are able um, to give um, the people that we will be working with, the bus drivers, the people that cook during um, the trip, the people that clean the rooms while the workers are out, we'll be able to give them gifts. And every year we get mission trip team shirts. And um, when we go on our mission trips, the people we serve with are like, those are so cool. Do you have any extra? And we finally got smart enough to order extra. And that's thanks to you guys and your generous um, giving that we're able to take some extra shirts and give them so that they can be part of the team. So even though you're not going physically on the trip, you are part of the team that's made it possible to do these wonderful things. The youth had a graduation recognition last Sunday. It was wonderful. We have three wonderful grads that we were celebrating. And thanks to your giving, we were able to um, spoil these grads and love on them as we should. Um, our wonderful, fantastic Patty Davis uh, did the Surviving the Inevitable last week, sharing her gifts and talents of coordinating people together and hosting this event for over 40 people. The church was able to help with some of that, but Patty really gave her gifts and talents with that. And then we want to take a minute to push pause and because we don't always just give with our checkbooks. We also give with our gifts, talents, and abilities. And Matt Chafin, who's sitting in our tech booth, so everyone can turn around and wave at him and make him turn three shades of red. Um, we just want to say how truly thankful we are, Matt, for all that you do. Not only does he serve here on Sunday, his kids came here for preschool. He's a, he's a, uh, his, he did preschool graduation when his kids were here, but he, he was able to stay for preschool graduation. He had to change all the settings in the back for the mics and all that because it's different settings than we use on Sunday. So he came early to change all that, took a day off work to run the back tech booth, and then stayed after that to put all the settings back. Well done, good and faithful servant. Good, well done. So we are so thankful for Matt and for many of you who do all of these things. Uh, and we just don't have enough time to thank everybody. But we see you and we thank you. Please um, get ready to hear the word of God as Mary reads our scripture. Good morning. The scripture today is from Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. 
The foolish ones took their lamps, but not to, did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us in you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, alerts, reminders, and notifications, oh my. My name is Mike Maxwell. I'm the pastor here at New Life. And uh, if you're with me and you know that you have um, too many alerts and notifications coming to you on a phone near you, can I get an amen? Amen. Um, you know, just, just scrolling through those notifications, I, after a while, just turned them on silent. Uh, and because, you know, they're just coming in all day long, and it's really hard to focus uh, when you've got, got these things just kind of coming in. So um, I, I recognized I turned them off, and then now I've, I've even stopped looking at them. Um, so uh, I should probably just stop them from coming in, uh, actually, and I don't know if you all are with me, but when they are daily coming in, they lose somewhat their effectiveness. Uh, raise your hand if, if you're with me and, and you're there, okay? And then there are times when I'm like, okay, well, maybe monthly, but even then I, I can have it come up and I can like kind of push it to the side and let it go. Um, and so... Annual reminders, friends, they kind of get me, <laughs> because if you miss the annual reminder, you're missing it for a whole nother year, right? And th- those seem to be pretty important. They seem a little bit weightier. Um, and recently, I've, I've come across the uh, realization that there are these things called national days, okay? Did you know that today is the national day of National Brisket Day and National Hamburger Day, Okay? <laughs> right? But the reality that I found out, these are designated by the government to commemorate or celebrate a specific event or aspect or a country's culture or history. But we have so many that for me, I think they're almost losing significance. We have 4,853 national days, okay? Spread that out. Let's do a little math. Over 365 days, you've got about 13 national days per day, okay? If you take your 24-hour period, okay, I'm going to stop right there. Anyway, but like Wednesday, this coming Wednesday is National Flip-Flop Day. You're welcome, okay? All right. Uh, Thursday is not only Ben's birthday, my son, but also National Go Barefoot Day and National Say Something Nice Day, okay? Okay. I think I'll be able to say something nice to him, and I might even do it barefooted, just to kind of get it all together. (laughs) Did you know that tomorrow, tomorrow is not only Memorial Day, but it is also National Biscuit Day, and wait for it, National Paper Clip Day. (laughs) Where would we be without National Paper Clip Day, people? Oh my gosh, make sure you mark your calendar for that. Anyway, but we have all these national holidays and it's easy for them to kind of come and go and and just kind of lose sight of them and their importance. And so thankfully, uh, the government has said, no, there are national holidays as well. Not just national days, national holidays. And in national holidays, there are 11. 11. 11 days that are set aside by the government for citizens to, for many to have a day off from work or school. And so Memorial Day is tomorrow. And I don't want us to run into Memorial Day without taking a recognition of the significance of this day. I don't want us to just have what American culture has made it out to be, which is just kind of an extended weekend, right? 
um, is a chance for pools to open or people to barbecue. It's so much more than that. It can be all of those things to gather people together, but mainly it is a federal holiday in the United States for honoring, remembering, and mourning the United Mesa, United not Methodist, United States military personnel and civilians who have lost their lives in battle or lost their lives as a result of an injury from battle. And so uh, it's a day where um, we need to make sure that um, we are, are praying for folks and that we're thanking folks for their service, right, and in remembering that people's lives are changed uh, people because of their acts of service. And um, tomorrow, um, I might encourage you to set your phone with a reminder or an alarm at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. in the afternoon is the National Moment of Remembrance uh, established by the Congress, uh, just trying to get all Americans, wherever they are, just to kind of push pause. Um, why 3 p.m.? Because that's often, and it's local time, uh, wherever um, you are in the United States of America, at your 3 p.m. is the time to push pause and to recognize this is a moment where I'm actually enjoying freedoms, right? Most Americans at 3 p.m. tomorrow are going to be enjoying freedoms, and we recognize they came to us at a cost, at a, at a price. And, and we want to take that somber moment and hold it uh, in unity, and so there are ways that we experience this Memorial Day as Americans, but there are also ways that we experience Memorial Day as American Christians. As American Christians, we can honor and remember those who died and, and preserve the right that we have to life and to liberty. We have freedom that other civilians around the globe do not have. I have been reading uh, for, for Lent, the weeks leading up to Easter. Um, my reading, devotion time, was spent with When Faith is Forbidden, 40 Days on the Front Lines with the Persecuted Christians. And let me just tell you, the entire rest of the world does not live as we do in Midlothian, Powhatan, Greater Richmond area, nor experience the freedoms that we do here. And we as Christians need to recognize that, uh, first and foremost, by the fact that we get to be here today worshiping openly without threat to our lives about what is going to be said. Um, and there are some who woke up early on a Sunday morning, walked miles in order to be with other followers of Jesus in hidden uh, areas, and then leave by daylight to walk hours home in order to be able to worship God together, right? And we're concerned about a 15-minute drive, <laughs> right? And sitting in a climate-controlled space without the threat of military coming in and um, doing all sorts of things. We have a lot to be thankful for. People gave their lives, and people today stand ready to give their lives, so we need to make sure that their sacrifice wasn't in vain and that we don't take it for granted. And so we're, we're pausing we need to remember, we need to thank, we need to pray for their health, their safety, their families, for um, the times they're away in long deployment, for their souls, for chaplains, the, the whole peace. We need to be in prayer. And friends, their lives, those who have given their lives in service to this country, they are a challenge and an inspiration for how we are to live our lives. So what we are doing and how, we, uh, um, and how far we're willing to submit to God for the sake of, of the kingdom and all others is what we need to be considering this morning. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 puts it this way. But our citizenship is what? In heaven. In heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior, what? From there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, friends, it doesn't just mean that, that we get to go to heaven after we die. It also means that we are to live on this earth according to the values of heaven. 
And so Revelation chapter 20 talks about the day of, of judgment. In um, seminary, uh, we all had to do a, a project. Um, I was taking a, a class on Revelation. We walked through it from beginning to end, and your entire grade was built on uh, one project that you um, worked on with the professor. And uh, I thought, wow, in Revelation, there is so much, dis, um, how do you say it, disagreement about how to interpret different things. But there is one thing that seems to be sure, and that is this day of judgment. So my entire um, project was on Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, taking four verses and working through every word uh, in the Greek of those four verses. And it's just a reminder to me that we can disagree about a whole bunch of things, but what we do know is that there is going to be this day. It's called the day. Even in, in the Old Testament, from beginning to end, we hear about the day when we will stand before God and we will be accountable for all that was entrusted into our care. All of our gifts, our talents, our, our abilities, our resources, right? Right? How did we use them? And we give an account. It's a sobering, sobering thought. And so we need to be preparing for the day. We absolutely need to be preparing for the day. Not as doomsday preppers. That was supposed to be funny. But as people who have oil ready in their lamps. Jesus told that, that parable of, of the ten bridesmaids saying that, and it's not so much a story of judgment. That's not the emphasis here, but in, in Matthew, if you look at the whole context, 23, 24, 25, all those chapters, he's, he's wrapping up last things he's saying to his disciples, and he's saying there is coming a day. And in this particular parable, the emphasis is not on judgment, but the emphasis is on being a story of preparation. And it's not just story from some far time off. No, it's a story of how we should be living today. It talks about the party that's to come, but the emphasis is how are we living today? And so in, in Matthew chapter 25, verse, verse 2, it says, Five of the bridesmaids were foolish, and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any what? Oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. And the bridegroom was a what? Long time in coming. Long time in coming. And they all became what? Drowsy. And then what? Fell asleep. Fell asleep. Today in America, because we're Americans and we're reading it with a 21st century lens, we think of a wedding, right, that, that happens on one day, and, and the wedding ceremony might be about an hour or so or a half hour or so. Um, but if the groom were to show up late, would that be bad or good? That'd be bad, right? It'd be very, very bad. All sorts of anxiety starts coming through people when one of the two, the bride or the groom, doesn't show up on time, right? Uh, all sorts of, uh, this is bad. But this was not the case in ancient uh, Near East, okay? At that time, it wasn't just a, a one-day, one-hour scenario. It was a week-long hoopla, okay? I mean, festivities happened all week long. And there's this preparation time that's happening. It could be for days. But the bride is getting ready with the, the bridesmaids, right? And at any moment, the bridegroom could arrive. Now, that's supposed to build <laughs> excitement, anticipation of what's going on, right? But there was kind of this, I don't know if... Trick is the right word or not, but the idea that the bridegroom in the ancient Near East would try to catch them falling asleep because then they would be startled and awake and all the more excited and enthusiastic about when the bridegroom had come. 
And so this whole point of the bridegroom delaying was to build anticipation. And if we make the translation that Jesus is talking about, get ready for the day, the wedding between the bride, that's us, the church, and Jesus, the bridegroom, right? That day when we will be held accountable and then after the wedding ceremony of the, the bringing together of the two that have agreed to be uh, together for all eternity, there is going to be a massive party. And Jesus is saying, I am delaying that your hearts might grow in enthusiasm and anticipation, not only of that day, but all the festivities that come after that day. And so today it's bad to show up late for a wedding, but then it was almost the point. Jesus in these uh, parables prior to the one that we just read is talking about heaven as a, as a party, as, as a banquet. You wondered if your God has some good things in store for you? Jesus tried to paint the picture all along. And then we get to Revelation at the very end, and it talks about a new heaven and, and a new earth, a place where there's going to be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more difficulty, no more suffering. Sounds good, huh? I mean, sign me up for that, people. It's going to be good. And then I love in his book, Heaven, Randy Alcorn um, goes through almost all of the biblical passages about heaven and paints this amazing picture of adventure, right? If you enjoy sightseeing, if you enjoy people watching, if you enjoy travel, if you love staring at your screensaver and going, oh my gosh, that's a place on planet earth, that's cool, then heaven, just magnify that over and over and over, and you've got heaven. A marvelous, awesome, awesome, not place, but experience with God, who is love, who there can be no fear in, and there will be no more suffering, there will be no more struggle. Sounds good, right? So much more than you get your own cloud and you got to play a harp, okay? I mean, just so much more, so much more. But in this story, every single one of those bridesmaids was caught off guard. We, we can understand and recognize that every single one of us will be caught off guard. We don't know the time, the day, the hour. We will be caught off as guard as well when the announcement came. Some were prepared and others were unprepared. And they couldn't go out on the street after dark without a lamp. Uh, it was forbidden. Uh, and you couldn't enter into the party if the door had been closed. And here in this story, we recognize that some couldn't go into the party. And then we read that, you know, they, they asked for these uh, ones who were prepared, you know, can we, can we have some of your oil? And we don't want to press this story and the parable too far. But in it, it's not that they weren't willing to share. It's just that no one can live your life for you. That's the point. Every single one of us is responsible for our spiritual condition before God. Our relationship with God, and I know in an American individualistic society, I don't want to make too much of that because there's a piece of this where the body and, and family and so much more, but, but there is no one who can live your life for you. There are times in our lives, if you've been a follower of Jesus for some time, you know you need to lean on somebody else's faith at time. Can I get an Amen. Right, And you lean on their faith. But in this moment, ultimately, when God asks, what do you make of my son Jesus? We need to be the ones who say, he is everything. Like there is, there is nothing else I'm leaning on other than Jesus. But it's fascinating in the story that this idea of getting prepared and in we make the translation about their, their spiritual lives, was only important when they saw the threat of them being excluded from the party or that the door was shut. Then they were interested in oil. Then they were interested in being prepared, but not in preparation 
And Jesus says, don't be, we will all be caught off guard, but prepare, prepare for the day, prepare for the day. And so in Matthew 25, verse 12, we, we read those haunting words, but he replied, truly, I tell you, read this last part with me. I don't know you. I don't know you. We don't want that to be said. I love how uh, Isabel just moments ago said, you know, well done, good and faithful servant, right? Those are the words we want to hear. And that's in that story that's right after this one. We don't want to hear the words, I don't know you. We do want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. But it's going to take effort. It's going to take self-control. It's going to take discipline in order to prepare. I'm not saying to earn your salvation because we know that comes from grace. It's not something we deserve. It's unmerited favor. But I am saying to live the life God is calling us to live in order to be prepared and help the people around us be prepared, it's going to take preparation. Michael Wilkins, who was a, a commentator on a commentary I read, said, life is fragile and fleeting. We know that. Life as we know it is coming to an end. Life as though, live as though Jesus is coming back today. Plan as though he is not coming back for a hundred years. Right? Live as if he's coming back today. What if Jesus were to come back today? Are we ready? Are we prepared? And Jesus says, oh, please, 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 please get ready. And then plan as if it's going to be a hundred years. So in a way, we need to be fighting for the day. Say amen if you know that the Christian walk is a struggle. Amen, right? Those who have walked the Christian journey at any length of time know that it is a struggle, right? It feels like, you know, a step forward, two steps back, you know, two steps forward, three steps back, whatever. And, and it just feels like a struggle at, at many times. We're winning, we're losing, we're on, we're off, we're aligned, we're, in, we're misaligned. We're, you know, it's, it's all of this. Because we know that the universe and even ourselves are unsurprisingly trending towards self-interest, towards chaos, towards disorder. I mean, the second law of thermodynamics is not only a, a principle for the natural universe, it's for our spiritual soul as well. Can I get an amen? We tend towards disorder. We tend towards sin. We tend towards disobedience. Left to ourselves, that's where we will naturally wind up. Add effort, add energy, add focus and attention, and allowing ourselves to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then we are cooperating with God to become all God intends for us to be. Soldiers go into strict physical training to prepare their bodies and their minds and hopefully their souls, right? They get up when everyone else is sleeping. They train when it's not 70 and sunny because often the battle is not going to be fought when it's 70 and sunny. Can I get an amen, right? And those who have walked the Christian life know that the battle in living for God and avoiding temptation and Allowing God to transform our lives is not always 70 and sunny. We've got to prepare for those days when it's not. Soldiers make sure that they have all the gear necessary, right? They've got on the, the equipment. They've got the, the canteen. They, they've got their, their weaponry. They've got uh, all the things that they need, but they are not just interested in their own gear. They are also interested that their fellow soldiers are equipped as well. And the same is true of the body of Christ. We cannot walk through this Christian journey alone on our own, thinking it's all about me, when we need to be looking out for the body of Christ, as much as we need the body of Christ looking out for us. And soldiers don't just fight for themselves or their own survival, but for those who are next to them, for their families, for their country, trying to protect and to preserve the opportunities in a way of life. And so is the case for the follower of Jesus. Friends, the struggle is real. 
Say it out loud with me. The struggle is real. The struggle is real, and it's, it's more clear the more we walk in this Christian life and the followers of Jesus can struggle for a lifetime to put off the old self and try and re- or, uh, recognize the lies of the enemy. They come at it all day long. It's like a barrage, an onslaught, overwhelming at times. And so that's why Paul, in almost all of his letters, and I just want to read four different occasions, says this theme over and over and over. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your what? Former way of life to what? Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be what? made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Pretty clear. Put off the old self, put on the new self. It's God's activity and we're cooperating with God's activity in our lives. Colossians chapter 3 verse 8 through 10. But now you also put them as All aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And it goes on and on and on. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12. And in him you have been made what? Come full right? You've been brought into his fullness. Sorry, I'm reading a little different version. In another version, it says, you have been made complete. Say, I am complete. Some of you all are in disbelief because you know I am incomplete, right? But there's a a way in which Paul here and in other passages, tries to paint a picture of what is our true reality. The evil one's trying to say, you are incomplete. But in Christ, we are already complete. I know it it blows my brain. (laughs) But God is outside of time. And he's saying, what was done on the cross is, is, is already done. You've already been raised. You are already dead to sin. You don't have to wait for power to overcome sin. It's available now. You are not waiting for victory. You are standing in victory. You are not incomplete. You are complete. So the next time the evil one tries to start saying some different lies to you, you just say, I am complete. I am Groot. No, you say, I, I, you know, um, I think in some way he could have said that and made it translate, but, but I am complete. A few weeks ago, uh, Rebecca was kind of sending us all out of here, like to, to go and be the church, and she said, you don't go to victory, you stand from victory. You go from victory. And that's this truth, that that's the truth about the person who has said, I, I'm leaning completely on Jesus. And only God could make you complete because we are very aware that we are still a work in progress. Sorry, none of that was in the message, but here we go. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. In him you have been brought to the fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In verse, uh, let's go on to 12. Go on to 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Romans chapter 6, verse 5. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we no longer be slaves to sin. Verse 7, for he who has died is free from sin. Friends, this new self, living into it, and the old self, putting it off, believing that the truth about who God says you are and how we're to operate in this world, because this world is a broken mess, 
how we're to offer peace and love and joy and encouragement in Jesus, no matter how long it takes, wherever it takes us, and any time we're asked to. That's that full surrender of giving our complete lives to God that the kingdom of God might advance. That's that soldier saying, I am at the disposal in this scenario completely all in for the protection and the provision of not only myself but my family and generations to follow me, freedom. And we know that Christ died to set us free. How do we, how do we live these days? There, there's a sense in which every day is somewhat of a fight. And it's not just this escalator ride to heaven. Just hoping it all turns out the way we hope it turns out. Maurice uh, Tournay was a missionary in the 1940s. Um, and he, there was intense persecution of Christians by uh, Buddhist monks in Tibet. And so um, Maurice Tournay was on his way to uh, visit the Dalai Lama to advocate for the Christians uh, to find relief in space and a place for the Christians away from the Buddhist monks in, in Tibet. And in, in this book, uh, 40 Days with the Martyrs on the Front Lines, um, there's this quote. Maurice Tournay says, Death is the happiest day of our lives. We must rejoice in it more than anything because it is our arrival in our what? True homeland. What if what Paul said is, is true, that our citizenship is not here on earth, but it is in heaven? And we think so much about our citizenship here on earth, but God wants us to be thinking about our citizenship in heaven. And it's, it's from that citizenship in heaven that we're supposed to live today. So how do we, how do we live for today? How are we living for the day? Well, in the United Methodist uh, funeral rite or celebration of life, it, it says a couple of things. It says that we might behold the mystery of death from the light of eternity. Right? If we view death from strictly an earthly perspective, oh, it is, it is rough. I've been at those funerals where the family had no faith, and, and it was gut-wrenching. There was no hope. And yet, I've also been at that funeral where, racked with grief, there is a family who still has hope. Like one of my favorite verses, First Thessalonians uh, says, Grieve, but not as those who have no hope. It doesn't say don't grieve, like don't feel, like that's like don't be human, right? It says grieve, but not as those who have no hope. So friends, we're, we're to live with this perspective that's in light of eternity. And you've heard the phrase, um, you know, some people are so heavenly minded they're of no earthly good. <laughs> um, but there are some people who are so earthly minded they're of no heavenly good. We've, we've got to have our minds transformed by Christ that we see things through the perspective of how God sees them. And so in the membership vows that, that we take and, and we say, you know, we want to be a part of the family of God and then we want to kind of live that out through this local family of the body of Christ we say, you know, that we will stand against evil and injustice and oppression. We are going to be fighting for the kingdom of heaven to be on earth. Your will in heaven be done on earth. That's what we're about while we're here, living for the day. Friends, I'm proud to be an American. I think our country has a, a long way to go. We have some healing that needs to happen. There is still injustice going on. 
And yet, when I look at nations around the world, I, I am proud to be an American. Not just the song, <laughs> but the reality. We have freedoms that are not afforded to all people on this planet. And I don't want to take them for granted. But we've got to recognize above our allegiance of being an American is our citizenship in heaven. And that's from which we need to see. So a daily reminder ought to be, um, well, Stephen Covey put it this way in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He said, begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. We wake up at the beginning of the day and, and we've got all sorts of directions that we can go. What is the end of the day that you hope for? What's the, and maybe that's too big to think about. At times in life it is. What, at the end of this hour, where, where do I want to be? At the end of this moment, where do I want to be? Begin with the end in mind. May we be heavenly minded so that we're of heavenly good. But we wake up Swing our feet over the side of the bed. Take a breath. All that I am is a gift from you, God. All that I have is a gift from you, God. So if I have time, let me live it for you, God. What resources I have, let me use them for you, God. May our breath remind us how we are to live for the day. Would you pray with me? God, this, this weekend is a reminder. It's kind of a wake-up call to get prepared. We don't want to take our um, freedoms for granted. We don't want to overlook the lives that were lost, that we might be in a space and a place to freely worship you. Forgive us for the times when we become so consumer-oriented and consumer-minded and that it's all about us, when it's really all about you and your kingdom. And this is why you've given us breath and life. And you call us in all sorts of different ways to, to live out that, that calling, but through our baptism, you call all of us to live for you. That at the end of our days, and we're standing face to face with you. And you ask, what have you done with my son? We can say, I am leaning completely on him for everything. For salvation. For strength. For encouragement. For hope. That you are the one who has led us against oppression against injustice, to bring about your peace. We've told people about your power and that joy that can come regardless of the situation we're in and the circumstances we're enduring, the joy that goes beyond happiness and what we have, and that contentment that can be found in you. Oh God, help us view these days on earth through the eyes of eternity. May we lean completely in you. For you are the one who has given us breath. You are the one who has given us life. You are the one who calls us. And so we respond and we say, send me. Send me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand and let's sing together. If it's bandaging the broken a washing filthy feet Here I am, Lord, send me If it's loving one another Even when we don't agree Here I am, Lord, send me If I'm poor, if I'm wealthy, I'll serve you just the same. Here I am, Lord, send me. On the mountain or the valley, Lord, I will choose to praise. Here I am.
And when we're standing in your glory, we'll be glad we chose to say, here I am, Lord, send me. And well done, good and faithful, I live to hear you say, here I am, Lord, send me. Sing it again. Here I am. my favorite songs. This has been a good Sunday for me. I don't know about you guys, but we're singing all my favorites. All right, my friends, that a great music today, great message. So now what? Well, next weekend, you're going to join me in prayer all week long that we don't have a Sunday like today. <laughs> because next weekend is our summer celebration. <laughs> June 4th, right after service, we're going to have a food truck out here. We're going to have an inflatable water slides, water games, lots of fun. And this isn't just for the littles. This is for the bigs, too, because how great is it to hear a child squeal in laughter? How wonderful is it to see um, fourth and fifth graders laughing and having fun? And, hey, ain't nothing saying, Tom Maxwell, that you can't wear your bathing suit and go down that slide. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Joan? <laughs> All right. So what we need from you is a couple of things. One, we need you to look around your life, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, your family. Who needs to be here next Sunday? These events are to celebrate and to have fellowship with each other, but it's also an opportunity to share the wonderful thing that Mike was talking about today, the gift that Jesus gave each and one of us to show people, hey, you should come to my church because next week is one of those weeks where people are going to come and go, this is a really cool church. And these are really cool people. Maybe questions aren't weird. <laughs> right? And the second thing that I need from you, 
oh, we're almost full. We need a few more volunteers for next week just to make sure that everything goes off efficiently. So if you can see me after church, that'd be great. If you're watching online, Isabel at newlifeumc.org, just email me. I just got a few more 30-minute slots that I need filled to make sure that everything goes great. And if you have a youth who is a rising seventh grader or if you have a youth 7th through 12th who's not connected in our youth group, next Saturday they are having a fun pool party to kick off the youth summer session. And so you want to connect with our youth director on that. So as you go this week, and we celebrate with hamburgers and hot dogs tomorrow and fly our American flags in remembrance of the soldiers who have lost their lives so that we can be free. I want you to go each and every day and remember the gift that Jesus Christ gave when he gave his life for each one of us. Go in the name of the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. A amen. Let my